All right. I want to welcome all of you to this evening's webinar, the Waypoint 55, and uh, we are glad that you're with us here tonight. And uh, Waypoint exists to help Christian churches and churches of Christ within the Mid-Atlantic region and beyond. And uh, we do that in a variety of ways, but our monthly webinar is designed to help leaders with different uh, dynamics within the church that they are dealing with. And we're trying to help them with perspective and strategy on how they can uh, how they can really make an impact in that particular ministry area. And so tonight our topic is the homeless and your church. And so uh, so we're going to have a, a guest presenter here, Dallas Stamper, in just a minute. Uh, but before we get started, as always, I want to give, uh, first of all, uh, credit to our ministry sponsor, our platform sponsor, Mid-Atlantic Christian University, who's a regional ministry partner with us and has been our sponsor for this webinar series ever since we began three years ago. And so we want to thank you, thank them for allowing us to have this webinar series as a partner in the region. And uh, I also want to tell those of you who are new on the, the webinar, if this is your first time, there's a couple of things uh, that you need to know. First of all, uh, that there is a question and answer uh, button at the bottom of your screen. And if there is any kind of question that comes to mind as we uh, go through the webinar tonight, you can hit that and ask and type in your question immediately. Don't wait till the end of the webinar. And it will go in a queue that Dallas and I can see uh, that, uh, that then we'll be able to either answer at that moment or near the end of the webinar, depending on the time, how the time works. Uh, but, but if you'll type it right when you think of the question, that's the most important thing. There's also a chat button that is at the bottom and don't use that. Uh, that's something that everybody can see where the Q&A button uh, goes directly to Dallas and me uh, for us to answer uh, when, when we can give a good answer for you. So that's the button that we want to do. We also want to know who's with us this evening. And uh, so because there's always more people viewing than there are uh, the number of computers that, that are with us. We've got about 20 computers so far. So I'm going to drive this little poll and have you let us know. That way we can let Mac you know how many people we have on each webinar during the year and how, mu how many there are for the whole year. Uh, last year we had 588 people join one of our 12 webinars for the year and from uh, from 13 different states and so uh, so we're glad that you're joining us tonight and uh, you, we've got one big one of seven or more that's awesome uh, maybe we should ask you to chat and tell us how many are, are in your seven or more uh, that way uh, we'll know for, for our attendance but uh, if you'll keep chiming in we're just about uh, down got a couple more to come in there but we'll get started um, uh, Dallas and I met, uh, it's hard to believe, more than 20 years ago at a church in Virginia Beach, and uh, he's going to tell his story. But I can tell you from my perspective, it's probably similar to a lot of you. I got into ministry when I was in graduate school uh, a long time ago. I, uh, I lived in and worked at an Episcopal cathedral in downtown Cincinnati, Ohio. And it was a great graduate school job because uh, I got to live in an apartment they had work whatever time to clean the building while I was in grad school. And that was really the first residence that my wife, Lisa, and I had uh, after we got married. <clears throat> and uh, because it was such an urban setting, uh, there, there was a constant um, uh, interaction with homeless people right there, uh, right there as you would enter the building. And uh, the old ladies that uh, were the secretaries of the church just taught me very early on, you need to ignore all of them because if you help one, then we got to help all of them. And so that was pretty much their standard uh, view on how to deal with the homeless as a church is just to ignore them uh, no matter what they do. And so, and I just never felt that was quite right. But at the same time, I think there's a lot of lessons churches can learn about uh, that you learn the hard way on what's the best ways and best ideas and, and uh, viewpoints on how you can try and make an impact with the homeless in your community. Uh, and so I've invited Dallas to do that. He's going to tell a story how he got into that from the beginning, but also for all of us that are on the call uh, tonight on some of the best practices we can have as we try to in, uh, interface with the homeless community in our areas. And so uh, Dallas, I'm going to just turn the uh, mic over to you. We're glad that you're with us tonight and just uh, really looking forward to what you'll share to us about the scope of your ministry now versus how it got started in the first place. Yeah, thank you. Well, um, like Tim said, um, I have this question answer thing here. So if you have a question as we're going through, I prefer a conversational way of presenting. So if you have a question, I'll probably go right to it. Um, 
And so, um, like Tim said, um, I've been doing this for a while. Um, so um, our ministry started in 2002. Um, so I did. I had less gray hairs when I started. Um, so currently, our ministry we we feed homeless people. We give them showers. We help. Um, we help. That we have hairstyles that come in, do haircuts. There's a lot of things we do, but we're based on four uh, four pillars. We call them the four pillars of Penn. I believe they're the four things that can help transform people's lives. And so the first pillar is medical. Um, medicine has become a political debate in our country. Um, but here's the thing: the homeless fall through the cracks. Um, whatever system we have, they fall through the cracks of that system. And so we have doctors and nurses that volunteer to come in and provide free medical care. And it's not even just like there are free clinics and things like that, but oftentimes if you get government funding, there's a lot of paperwork that has to be filled out. Um, and so uh, a lot of times people that are homeless will get frustrated going through the paperwork and just give up. And one of the things you're going to, I'll talk about in our ministry and how your churches can help is oftentimes um, homeless people have been turned down for so many things that they, they just give up eventually. Um, and one of the things we can do is go alongside them and encourage them. Our second pillar is our recovery groups. We, um, we run 12-step groups. Uh, we use a, a Christian model. You may be familiar with Celebrate Recovery. We have a local model called Recovery for Life we use here. And so it's a 12-step Christ-based uh, recovery program that we've been really successful with. And so it helps people to deal with their addiction issues. One of the things we're um, in the process of doing is the uh, um, dealing with your addiction issues, great, but there's, a, there's always underlying brokenness when you're talking about addiction issues. So we're in the process of getting counselors in. So once people have, have really dealt with their addiction, they can deal with the underlying issues that caused the addiction in the first place. And um, our third pillar is our job training program. Um, oftentimes people will see somebody um, holding up a sign says, we'll work for food and they go, why don't you just work? And so we have a job training program to help people work. And, and, and it, we'll get into this, that um, being homeless, can, it can be very difficult to work while you're homeless. And there's a lot of obstacles that come up. And so hopefully I'll get a chance to share some of those obstacles. Um, um, being homeless can be a full-time job sometimes. So we'll talk about some of that. And our fourth pillar is housing. Um, housing is an important thing um, if you're homeless. Um, and, and in our country, we have a model of the government using called Housing First which I think is a great um, model, but the problem is, is when it becomes housing only. Um, because most homeless people have had a house before. Um, they've lost it for one reason or the other. And so um, we really, as a ministry, wanna look at a holistic approach. And so Tim said, I should, should start out by telling you how our ministry started, because it's not, it sounds like a lot going on and it is, um, but it didn't start out that way. Um, basically in 2002, my wife and I were in church and we heard a sermon about, do you love poor people? Actually, um, it was a church that Tim pastored and our, it was our missions pastor, Mark Miller, that said that, do you love poor people? And so my wife and I went home and said, yeah, Jesus loves poor people and we love Jesus, so we love poor people. It's kind of like saying LeBron James is really good at basketball and I watch him on TV, so I'm really good at basketball. And so um, we realized there was nothing in our lives that indicated we love poor people. We didn't know any poor people. We didn't have any relationships with any poor people. And so we made some sandwiches and took them down to the ocean front. Um, the first couple Sundays were interesting because some of the people we saw were like surfers. You know, we live in a beach community here. And so surfers look kind of homeless. Um, and so, but we met four homeless guys and we gave them sandwiches. Um, and ultimately our goal was to love them. Um, we didn't know how to do that. Um, we didn't, think we had anything in common with them and so we took sandwiches down there and so and we did that for a period of time so um where we just take sandwiches down and it just kept growing and growing and growing like the first time we went there there were four homeless guys then there were seven then there were 11 um till after about six months we were serving 60 people from the back of our our, our ford explorer and it just kept growing and growing and growing and and it's interesting because i um um mark Miller, who was our missions pastor at the time, um, came to me and said, I want to put this out in the church. And I was like, no, I don't want to do that. Um, I just want us to pray and, and, and the people will come. And it was crazy how it just people started coming. It was the word of mouth among um, believers saying, hey, you know, I had people that came up to me and said, I've always wanted to help the homeless, but I was afraid to. And um, I just say, well, hey, come with us and, and we'll help. Um, it, was, um, about two it was about 2004 where the Lord was putting in my heart that I needed to do this full time. 
Um, just to let you know what my profession was, I was an engineering manager at General Electric, um, and they pay really well. Um, and so I was making a lot of money. And so I spent about six months trying to recruit an executive director for the ministry. I had a lot of lunches and told people to think outside the box. And every time I would talk to somebody, but they would be like, but you're leading that. <laughs> I'm like, no, 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 no. And so uh, eventually the Lord put it on my heart that I had to leave my job and do this full time. So my wife and I, we sold our house and bought a smaller house. Um, it's embarrassing to say this as a Christian, but I had to learn to live on less that I was so accustomed, even, you know, I could be generous, but I was being generous out of excess. Um, and I had to really learn to live on less, which is embarrassing to say that I had so much that I had to teach myself and my family how to live on less, and we did it. Um, so in 2006, I left my job at General Electric to start doing this. Didn't have a clue what I was doing. Um, didn't need a clue, actually. Um, it's kind of interesting. Um, I have a business I have an engineering background and a business background from GE, and that's literally all I needed to run this nonprofit. And it's funny because I don't run it like a nonprofit. I run it like a business. Um, I, I hate it when I worked at GE. I had to do budgets, and I had to – those were the things I hated. I just wanted to do the engineering stuff. And so I always hated that. But then once I started this nonprofit, all those business things came in handy to help me to start and manage our – organization. And so that's kind of how we started. Um, it was just my wife and I with a calling the Lord put on our hearts to go out there. We have hundreds of volunteers now. Um, we probably have about 50 to 60 churches locally that support us, um, you know, and, and, it, and it started with just listening to God's call. Um, and just so you know, so you don't, I'm not specially like equipped to do this. I'm just a regular guy that was willing to do it. So um, oftentimes people get so afraid, they're like, I'm not gonna be able to do what you're doing. And I'm like, nuts, you could, um, it's not overly complex. So we actually had somebody who left our ministry and went down to Charlotte and for a period of time, they had um, a similar type ministry down there. It doesn't take a lot of money to go out and, and actually do something like what we're doing. Um, so I, I wanted to share with you kind of the phases of homelessness. So when you see a homeless person on the side of the road, they're not all the same. So I wanted to kind of talk about the, there's three phases of homelessness. And so the first phase is that we call, I call entry. Um, so that's when you become homeless. So in the beginning, when most people become homeless, they don't, they won't even acknowledge that they're homeless um, because most people don't go from being in a house to being homeless. Most people go from being in a house to struggling to keep a room Maybe they're staying at a person's house. Maybe they get a hotel room for two nights and they're, maybe they sleep in their car for a period of time. And um, in that entry level, most people won't even acknowledge that they're homeless. If you ask them, like we have, a, we have a job training program, I have a lady who's in that entry phase and she won't even acknowledge she's homeless. Now she doesn't have a place to live, but um, that doesn't matter because um, it's actually a good thing because you you're not identifying as homeless. Um, we're going to talk in the third phase where your identity becomes homelessness. That's where it becomes dangerous um, because um, what, the way you see yourself is important. Um, and so if you see yourself as homeless, it makes it much more difficult because now I have to change your identity. So that entry levels anywhere from zero um, to six months. Zero to six months, usually people are in that entry mode. Um, and so a lot of times they'll be shy about trying to get things. They'll, um, they'll, they'll not know all the resources. Oftentimes, if I see somebody, I can kind of tell. Um, if, if they look like they're pretty new out there, they're kind of shy. Those people won't be holding a sign that says, we'll work for food. That comes in the second phase and the third phase. The first phase, they don't see themselves as homeless. They see themselves as somebody going through a tough time. Um, the, the, the hard thing is they're hard to identify because they're not open about it. But that's the best phase to try to help somebody to get off the street. The longer you spend as in, in homelessness, the, the, the more difficult it's gonna to be to change that. And so um, for me, one of the big things is trying to find the people those first six months, um, because then you have the, you'll have the best success with people in that phase. Um, the second phase I call survival mode. Now survival mode is, is, is after that first opening time. So some people go from two months to five years in survival mode. Survival mode is I just gonna do what I can to um, survive. Um, that means I'm going to learn a story that makes people give me money. Um, 
it, you may not get the whole truth when you ask somebody a story. They're gonna find out what pulls at the heartstrings and that's gonna be the story. Um, it's usually based on truth, um, but not always completely true. Um, because they're going to figure out what it is that you, you, you what it is that will part you from your money as quickly as possible. And it's a marketing thing. And so um, that's, that's, and they learn, and, and, and a lot of times people in that phase, they'll hustle you. Um, and, and what they'll do is they'll, they've been hustled because when they came into entry mode, somebody took advantage of them. And so they learn the tricks of the trade by being hustled or by somebody doing something to them. And so now they're going to hustle other homeless people. They'll find a brand new person and run the same scams um, on somebody else that they've run on, um, on, on them. I I've, I've know a lot about hustles because I've been hustled in every way you possibly can and still get hustled. Um, I'm a sucker for a sad story. And when somebody tells me something, I really want to believe it, even when I'm not 100% sure or not even 40% sure that it's true. Um, and so oftentimes in survival mode, those will be the people that you get a bad taste in your mouth because of, because they'll be the ones that make up a lie and tell you, I need this and I need that. And Tim was saying earlier, they said they didn't help anybody. It was probably because of people in survival mode, um, cause they learned, you know, nobody likes being hustled. Um, and so, and I, what I always tell people is, um, don't worry about the results of your giving. Um, because God sees your heart. So um, don't beat yourself up too badly. If you get hustled, you won't be the first and you won't be the last. Um, the danger is when your heart becomes so hard that you don't do anything. And that's one of the things with my staff that I do to encourage them because we're constantly in this, um, doing this is not to get hard hearts. And one of the um, quotes we have around here is let's make errors on the side of grace. And so, um, so we can't do wrong when we make errors on the side of grace. And then we get to the third phase and the third phase I call lifer phase. Now, a lifer is um, somebody who, if you ask them, they would say, I like being homeless. I like being homeless. And I always get people who don't wanna give money who tell me, well, I talked to a guy and he wants to be homeless. Um, let me tell you two things about that. Um, that's really um, this word in, in, um, institutionalized, we use in the jail system, but it's also true in homelessness. Like if somebody gets a life sentence, um, they will give up hope of ever getting out. And so they'll, um, so to cope with their environment, what they say is, I want to be here. Um, but ultimately, they don't really want to be there. They've just made that what they say. So oftentimes, what we see is homeless people will say, I want to be homeless. I'm happy being out here. Um, but it really isn't that they're happy being out there, is that they don't believe they can change that. And so um, they basically accept the story that I'm happy being out here. Um, the, the, somebody who's a lifer is the most difficult person to change. So uh, an example is there's a guy that is in our ministry. We helped him get into housing and he'd been homeless for 15 years. Um, and he has a cat and we actually worked with him to help the um, landlord let him have his cat go into the apartment. Well, his cat's so used to walking around that he opens the door and just lets the cat walk everywhere around the apartment complex. The landlord got angry and I had to sit down with him and explain, you have to keep your cat in your apartment. And um, he was getting frustrated with that because his cat was used to walking around. And so it's, we had a guy one time that had been homeless for 20 years. We got him into his place. And for the first four months, he slept outside in the grass. So he wouldn't sleep in the apartment because he was, he didn't like the walls. And so for, for those wow. of you listening, that probably sounds weird to you, but that's, you get used to something and over a period of time that becomes your reality. So the people that are lifers that I've seen, they, they need more help when they get into their place. Um, they'll oftentimes make mistakes because um, they're used to living um, in a certain way. So um, I wanted to share with you some of the mistakes that I believe churches make um, when they deal with the homeless. And so the first thing I'll, I wanna say is hey, that- I believe, I'm sorry. Val, let me inter interrupt you just for a second. That's two great things, the four pillars and the three phases. Yes. Uh, I want to remind folks uh, to go ahead and hit a Q &A, the Q&A button if they've got questions yes. about either of those two parts. But also, I forgot to say when we got started that there will be a follow-up email that happens 24 hours from now that every participant will get. And in that email, I will include your email address and your PIN um, your PIN uh, ministry uh, website, people in need. You talked about PIN. That's people. That's yeah. your ministry. It's called. People in need. I forgot to say that. 
<laughs> yeah, and so um, so your website and your email will be included in that follow up email tomorrow for them to follow on with you if uh, if they don't ask you a question tonight. But if you got a question, go ahead and chime in tonight so that we can uh, so that we can try and address that for everyone here this evening. All right, go ahead, Dallas. Dal right, Sorry. Okay. To no worries. So um, let me talk about common mistakes churches make. So um, Tim said we're all brothers and sisters here, so I can say whatever I want. And so I want to share with you some things that as a nonprofit, a Christian nonprofit, um, things that um, churches sometimes do unintentionally that hurt the homeless and, and, and hurts us um, in the process. So the first thing is I always say you should get your church involved with organizations that help homeless people. I think by all means, I think what happens sometimes like uh, Tim's example earlier where the church said, we don't want to help anybody. Um, they need, you need to find an organization. If you have one close by that helps homeless people, find a good organization that helps homeless people and partner with them. Um, for us, it's, it really is the partnerships are extremely important. But um, one of the things I would challenge you is when you do go out to help a homeless organization is to be honest about your motives. Um, if, you know, is your motives to market your church that we're the church that helps homeless people or is your, your motive really to help homeless people? And you, it might, look, I believe marketing is an important thing and I do a lot of it here, but I think we need to be honest about our motives when we go out and help. Um, oftentimes I'll get churches that come to me and say, we're going to help you from nine to 11 on this day. And sometimes I don't even have things for them to do on that day. And so what I'll do is make up something for them to do that day. And as opposed to what I have, very few churches come to me and say, how can we help you? In what way can we help you? And I do have a few churches that do that, but that's the minority. It's normally, um, we want to serve from this date to this date. And it becomes a very sort of, uh, only way to say it is a selfish way to serve. You know, it's, I'm going to help you, but I'm going to give you the terms by which I'm going to help you. And for the nonprofit, like, the cool thing for me is this is not a lot of people probably from Virginia Beach. If I was had a had a, a thing here for Virginia Beach, I would struggle saying this because that's how we get our support. Um, but it would be good for 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 the organizations helping to say, how can we help you? What is it you need us to do? And as we get into how individuals can help, we'll talk about how oftentimes we try to help people in the way we expect that they need help as opposed to just asking. One of the big things um, that, um, that I've found is one of the most powerful things you can do is ask a question. Um, no nonprofit director is gonna be upset if you come to him and say, how can I help you? And, and honestly, if churches came to me um, and said, how can I help you? And I told them and they couldn't fill that, I'd be super psyched. I'd say, that's okay. Maybe somebody else can fill that need. But what, it, what ends up happening is if you say, I can only come Saturday from nine to 11, and I don't have anything for you to do. Now I got to spend a bunch of time figuring out what I'm going to do to make up something so that you can do that. And, and it really becomes a difficult situation for the nonprofit. Um, and, and I know that the churches mean well, um, but it, it needs to, to me, it would be much better if, if it was a two way street talking back and forth. Um, and, and, and really it's just being honest about it. Um, and so, um, Oftentimes, nonprofit, um, as a nonprofit, you're afraid sometimes to, to, to tell, like if a church comes to me that supports us and says, we want to come from this time to this time, I'm not going to tell them you can't come from that. We don't need your help then. We're going to find something to do. Um, but what would be more beneficial for us is if you have a homeless ministry in your area, is just go to them and say, what is the thing that we could do for you to help you to help the homeless? And, and I guarantee you, they'll probably look at you shocked, but they will have things that you can do. Um, the second thing is, um, if you have, um, you know, um, you, you are pastors of churches and you're kind of the experts in what your church is, well, us as homeless ministry, we kind of become the experts in how to help the homeless. And so um, along that same line, I would encourage you to, to sit down and, and, and talk to those nonprofits about how we can help homeless people in, in the area you're in. So like, I know a lot about helping homeless people at the, at, in Virginia Beach, but I bet it's different if you're in a rural area or if you're in an urban area. And so, um, so the important thing would be to go to those nonprofits and as leaders in the church, whether they're a Christian ministry or not, go to them and ask them, what is it that our area needs to help homeless people? 
Um, that's a powerful question to ask because if you're truly trying to help, then you're gonna, by asking the question, they will say, these are the things we need. Like for us, what we need is we need more volunteers during the week. And so um, our weekends are packed and my staff is really busy trying to figure out how to keep everybody busy. Like everybody seems to want to volunteer from nine to 11 on Saturday. And we run out of stuff to do from nine to 11 on Saturday. If somebody came to me, a church came to me and said, I need help, what do you need? We need more help like on the weekday. And there might be some, you know, some people that go to your church that have, that could come in uh, Tuesday morning from eight to 11. And that's when we really need people. Um, the third thing that I would say is, um, is being careful that you don't come to, um, and this is both just the church and individuals that you don't feel like you're going to come and, and, and give them the answer that they need to fix their life. Um, and this is no different than in ministry. Oftentimes, and this is the thing that blew me away. When I, came, when I started this ministry, I thought I was going to go out and tell everybody what to do to fix their lives. Um, and what I've learned um, is that not, all of, not everybody grows up um, and comes up in the same environment. Um, I grew up in a two-parent two house. It wasn't a very loving two-parent house, but it was a two-parent house. And um, people who lit, grow up in poor neighborhoods in our country don't have the same environment. Um, and they don't grow up with the same environment. So we sort of come with a way of fixing their life that may not fit for them. And one of the biggest things I've learned is oftentimes is asking, not just asking them what's wrong in their life and how you can fix it, but ask them how they got there. Um, because a lot of times if you come in and say, hey, here's the three steps to fix your life, um, some of that will be like, you know, speaking a foreign language to them. Um, because they don't, they didn't come from the same environment that you came from or I came from. So they're kind of, you know, afraid to, you know, and, and oftentimes they won't say anything because that's where they get support from. Um, the most religious sounding people you'll ever meet are homeless people. And when I, that's the thing, when I first came out here, they sounded more like Christians than I did um, because that's how they got stuff from people. Um, they learn the words we use and they say them. Um, it's funny because when I first went out and started helping the homeless for the first six months, I didn't even tell them I was a Christian. And some of the things I learned about what they would say to Christians to get things from them was, was actually funny. Um, and you know, they, the one, there was one time they said, the Filipino church comes out and if you say, praise the Lord, you get more mashed potatoes, you know? And so <laughs> it's sort of that, that thought process that they are learning to say things that mean nothing to them because they're trying to get things from us. And so one of the, the, the things that I'm big on is trying to strip that down. And the only way to strip that down is by building a relationship. Now, you might not have the time to go out and build a, re a relationship with a homeless person, but I guarantee you, you probably can interact with an organization that already has that relationship. And that's one of the things Penn does is we build relationships to allow people to come out and to do that. And so that's a big thing. Um, the, big, the other thing, too, is the nonprofits need money. Um, I would encourage you to be prayerful about, as you're partnering with these organizations, if they do a good job, consider giving to them if you're not already. Um, you know, um, I see sometimes churches come and help us, and they, you know, their T-shirt budget is bigger than what they give us. You know, and so, um, and just the T-shirts they put on when they come out and say, we're coming to help pin T-shirts. You know, I was thinking in my head, if you didn't have those t-shirts and just wore your regular clothes, we could have used that money to get soap for somebody. So I would encourage you if you're not, if you are partnering with an organization to consider giving to them. It's the same thing we say on church on Sunday. And it's true um, that, that being generous is, is, is important for nonprofits because they, they, they are, if, once you find a good nonprofit, they're going to be the vehicle by which you're helping people. And so they know the best way to spend your money um, and they know the ways to do that. I know I'm good at that here, but I guarantee you all over the country, there's organizations like ours that, that know how to spend that money and would be very thankful for it. Um, so let me, let me talk about common mistakes people make. I don't know how I'm doing on time. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about, I wanna talk about, uh, and I'll stop talking if you send a question. So if you have a question, you can. If, you, if I get you angry, go ahead and put that up there too. I'd love to talk about it. But um, <laughs> um, so the first thing is money doesn't fix everything. Um, I don't know, I can count, most, most pastors preach that really well, but it's true with homelessness too. Money doesn't fix every problem. 
Um, and so giving people money does not fix their problem. Um, you know, the minimum wage um, is in Virginia Beach is, is like three, is like 725. Um, and you can make hundreds of dollars panhandling on the street corner. Um, so we have a job training program and we, we have some good companies that partner with us and we help people get $15, you know, $15 an hour jobs, but still you can make two to $300 on a street corner panhandling. And so if you can make two to $300 on a street corner panhandling, why would you go to work? I've actually had homeless people ask me, why should I go to work? And so um, giving money almost never is the right decision. Um, and, but what I say is um, ask questions. Like, so a perfect example would be is ask them, what is it you need this money for? Um, and then see what the answer is. Um, you know, oftentimes when people are panhandling for money, it's for drugs or alcohol. So ask them the question, what is it that you need the money for? If you ask them that question and they have a, a well thought out answer, then consider helping them with that. Most of the time, if you ask that question to a homeless person, they'll go, um, 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 and then you know that they're, they're not, they're going to buy alcohol or drugs with it. Um, that's not going to help them. Um, I was telling Tim the story. I had a homeless guy I was working with who had a serious drug, drug and alcohol addiction, and he was drunk on a street, on, on our, on an inter, interstate, um, 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 off, off ramp. And I pulled over and he was like stumbling drunk and people were handing him money. And um, so like cars would pull up and I'd say, stop giving him money, he's drunk. Um, literally the next morning I went to check on him. I found him by following the dollar bills out to his campsite. And, um, and I think the reason why we give people money like that is because it, it makes us feel good, honestly. It's not to help them, it's to make us feel good because we feel guilty. They're holding a sign that says, we'll work for food. They're, um, they look sad, that's on purpose. Um, they're, they're marketing to you so that they can get the money they need. And um, I'm going to tell you that most of the people that are panhandling are homeless. You know, a lot of people, I've read some stats where they say it's a higher number that aren't homeless, but most people that panhandle are homeless. Um, but if you hand them money, it's not going to go for probably the best thing or what you would want them to. So what I would encourage you to do is ask questions, like ask them, what is it what can I do to help you? Um, it's powerful what questions can, can do to open up a conversation. Um, so one of the big things I always tell people is even if you're not gonna give somebody something, make eye contact. So here's the thing that, um, that I, I encourage people to do, and I, I, don't give, I don't give homeless people money, but if they ask me for money, I look at them and say, I look at them in the eyes and say, no, I'm not gonna give you money today. It's biblical, look at what Peter did when he had a beggar at, in front of the temple. And, and so like, I will always look in the eyes though. Most of the time when you see a homeless person, you'll not look in the eyes because you're afraid of the question, but that's okay, look them in the eyes and say, I can't help you with that, but I hope you have a great day. Or do you, if you serve at a ministry, um, say, hey, do you know about so-and-so ministry or so-and-so homeless outreach? Um, and try to point them in the right direction. Um, the third thing I would say is um, ask them, uh, once again, ask them what they need. Um, I had a lady one time who, um, who um, she came to me one time and said, Dallas, why do churches keep giving me toothbrushes? And I said, what do you mean by that? She goes, I've got eight toothbrushes in my backpack right now, and the church that we just went through gave me another toothbrush. And I said, well, that's because their image of a homeless person is somebody who has bad teeth and they need to brush their teeth. And her question to me was, well, why don't they just ask me what I need? And so I think in a lot of ways, it's the conversation. It's, you know, it's not, and I would say, you know, we're really busy, I'm busy. Like every time I do a talk like this, I end up having a homeless person wanting to stop me at the most inopportune time. But that is the power, the conversation that you can have with somebody as they are, um, as they are approaching you. Um, and, and, and to me, that is the power of, of being a Christian is just to be able to, you know, I think we put too much pressure on ourselves to, to go share Jesus with people. And, um, and, and that's a great thing. And it's something that I incorporate into my everyday life. But one of the most powerful things is just love somebody. It's like, just listen to them. 
Um, what if like the next homeless person you saw, you didn't try to fix their problem, you just listened to it. Uh, my wife taught me this in my marriage. I've been married 33 years and she's taught me, you know, I don't need you to solve all my problems. I need you to listen sometimes. And homeless people need that. They don't always need you to solve their problems. Oftentimes they just need you to listen. Um, and there's some power in that because um, they know you're busy. They probably know that you can be doing a ton more things. But if you just sat down and listened, there'd be so much power in that, um, I think. So um, any questions? So far, none. We'd love okay, people to chime in. Maybe I'm just I being so good at this that, you know, there's no questions. So, um, so let me um, talk a little bit about um, um, how your church can, um, can be more active in helping the homeless. So I, I talked from a nonprofit perspective that you should go out and, and um, you know, work with a nonprofit, but it doesn't have to be that complex either. Um, I've seen churches that actually just decided that they were going to go out and do something for the homeless, something different. Um, and so one of the things that I, 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 and I love it. I, you know, I don't think that every church needs to come through me to help the homeless. Um, and so, but one of the things that I would encourage you to do is when you do that is try to talk to somebody who knows the homeless so that you can sort of engage in, in a way that would be respectful of them. Um, and respectful of things they need. So it might be a question like, what is it that the homeless need? So one of the things I always tell people is that um, if you're going out to give the homeless, pe homeless people something is to get $5 gift cards to McDonald's. Um, and the reason why I say that, and this is probably good in any area, is that um, when it's cold out, homeless people oftentimes can't be in a restaurant unless they're a paying customer. And so if you have a gift card to McDonald's, you can get like a coffee for $1.50 and you can get refills and that makes you a paying customer. And so um, we actually, one of the ways we encourage people to, to participate in our organization is oftentimes we'll give them a $5 gift card to McDonald's. And so that gives them, that could give them three days of warmth in a, uh, a McDonald's because they are a paying customer. Um, so those are things that you can give to people. I always encourage people, once again, don't give money, but it might be just bags of socks that you, you know, if you put some socks in your cars, I can guarantee you that most homeless people, whatever socks they have on, they need another pair. Um, we give out clothing here and we give out hundreds of pairs of socks um, every year um, um, to people that are homeless. And so maybe even just buying a pack of socks and having them in your car. And when you see a homeless person, they, they'd probably be shocked. You say, hey, here's a pair of socks for you. Because um, it does show that you're thinking about them ahead of time. Um, because um, it shows that you're being conscientious about them. And so I, we got our first question. Thank you, Ronnie. Uh -huh. There you go. All right, so what do you recommend doing with a homeless traveler who needs a place to stay for the night and there is no shelter nearby or um, they are unwilling to go there? So the first, the, that's a great question, by the way. Um, that's a tough question, isn't it? Um, so the first question I would ask is why, ask them this question, why are you unwilling to go there? Um, I think um, oftentimes, um, and if they have a good answer, um, there might be, you know, look, you know, you, there might be so many people, sometimes in shelter situations, there's 20, 30 people there, and it just might be, um, I'm kind of an introvert, and so, like, I don't like being around a bunch of people either, like, men's retreats ain't my favorite thing, because um, I don't like sleeping with a bunch of men in a, in a, in, in bunk beds. Um, and so that might be the situation, but ask them why they're not willing to go to the shelter nearby. Um, the second question would be is really, if you're willing to put them in a place, then put them in a place. Um, one of the things I've found here in Virginia Beach is the, the biggest um, dead end that we've ever had is putting people in hotels. Um, putting people in hotels never solves their problem. Um, but if it's a cold night, you know, I always say don't, don't um, outthink the Holy Spirit. And so be prayerful about it. Um, I've given homeless people money, um, but that's because the Holy Spirit told me to. And so um, one of the things I always say is be careful not to um, outprogram the Holy Spirit. And so, but, but it starts with a conversation. I would ask them, why are you not willing to stay in the shelter? Ask them that question. And there might be questions, there might be things like, you know, it's, it's, it's not a comfortable place to sleep. Um, I don't like being around people. Um, you know, 
usually if I hear them say they don't want to help me, that's a red flag for me to, that there's some deeper things there. Mm -hmm. um, but if they come back with an answer, if they say they don't want to help me, that's probably not true. Um, they probably got kicked out for some reasons or um, um, they just don't want to stay there. So if they say things like, and it's too crowded in there, I don't want to stay there, then that might be a, a situation where you, you might give them a place if you could afford to. I've done that many a times is put somebody up in a room for a night. Um, so and that really depends on you want to be careful about that because anytime you're talking about putting somebody in a room, it becomes a little bit tricky. Um, you know, you don't want to put yourself in a position to get hurt either. Um, you know, but I, it's interesting when I started this ministry, I didn't tell my wife all these things, but there was one time that there was a, um, a baby that was in a crack house. Um, and actually, um, a former pastor at Forefront Church, Chris Garrett, and I went over there and got the baby out. Um, so I didn't tell my wife that that night because she would have been mad. But, um, you know, it's one of those things where I think it starts with the conversation. So, Ronnie, next time you see a homeless person that doesn't, isn't willing to go to the shelter, I would ask them why they're not willing to go. Um, have a real conversation about that. And then if, there's, if you have a connection with that shelter, I would recommend going over and talking to the executive director and say, I was talking to a homeless person and they said this, why would they get this impression? Because um, they may not even realize it. Um, and so, um, and, and other people may feel that way. Um, I love it when um, a homeless person says something bad about our ministry and the person brings it to me because it gives me the opportunity to see maybe I do have a problem here that I need to address. Um, since we've grown to a point where I have se several staff members, there are things that happen I don't know about. Um, and so we may in some ways be unintentionally not giving the best services that we want to. So no, that's a great question. Dallas, let me ask a uh, follow-up to that is, uh, you said he might have got kicked out of a, of a shelter. What are, I guess we could probably guess, but what are the typical reasons guys will get kicked out or told that they can't, they're not welcome at a shelter? Yeah, typically some of those reasons are like drinking or doing drugs on the property. It could be fighting. Um, you know, we, we, we put people out for um, things like it's always behavioral issues. Um, if you, there's a lot of people that are out on the street that have mental, se severe mental health problems. And when you get too many people with severe mental health problems in the same room, there's going to be problems. And so, um, and especially um, with drugs and alcohol involved, one of the things I do every day that we're open is I, the troublemakers, I go and shake their hands. Um, and really what I'm trying to figure out is where, where are they at that day? Um, and so, and also for the, the people that are heavy drinkers or drug users, I'll get up close to them so I can smell and see how much they've had to drink. Um, I've been doing this long enough that I can not only tell what they've been drinking, but how much they've been drinking, um, by a simple handshake. So, um, a lot of times they'll get kicked out for behavior issues, or maybe, um, we, we're in it, we have a partner church that lets us, um, serve on Sundays. And I caught a guy in the bathroom smoking marijuana um, and I had to put him out for um, two months because um, I had to make sure the church knew that I was serious about people using drugs on their property. Now I would only put him out for a month. He wouldn't admit it. So I would have put him out for just one month if he would have admitted it, but he, you know, I caught him doing it and he wouldn't admit it. And so um, oftentimes people get put out for, you know, in rent, especially in our ministry, but most ministries or organizations I've seen, it's usually for behavior issues. Like I don't have a rule on um, being drunk or being high. Um, we want to serve everybody as long as they're behaving and, and treating everybody right. Um, feel like, um, you know, actually if somebody's high or, or drunk, I want them to be with us because um, they're probably not going to hurt somebody. Um, and, and it's funny because we actually, we have a church service for the homeless. And so oftentimes we'll, the first time somebody comes to our church is usually drunk. It's, you know, it's the opposite of most churches. Most churches, people won't go when they're drunk. Um, but, and it's funny because then once they become Christians and they start to live out the life, um, live out a Christian life, they'll start to criticize all the people that come drunk. I had one homeless guy one time that said, Dad, you should keep letting all these drunk people in. I'm like, well, you wouldn't have been here if I had a rule against it. And so it's, it's really making people feel comfortable, but it's really behavioral issues that I'm really concerned about because I don't want somebody to hurt somebody. We have, we have a homeless guy that has severe mental health issues and his name's Joseph. And so depending on, and we have a board where you write down your name to get a shower. So depending on the name he writes down depends on how, how 
crazy he is that day. So if he writes down Joseph, he's in his right mind. If he writes down Joe, he's still pretty good. If he writes Joe Joe, he's crazy. And so like, it's just his personality <laughs> changes. So the other day he wrote down Jojo. And so he was sitting at the table and I sat beside him. I was like, hey, Jojo, can we, can we be good today? He's like, yeah, Dallas, I'll be good today. <laughs> but it was understanding <laughs> him and being able to sit down and address him like that. And it's crazy, like just sometimes having that conversation. He knows he has a mental illness. He knows that he's not like everybody else. And so sometimes just having that conversation with him it's really powerful, but you can only do it when you know people. Um, one of the things that um, I encourage people to do is if you see a person panhandling and you got time to go have breakfast, invite them to breakfast. First of all, if their sign says we'll work for food, then we'll eat food for free should be in that category. Um, and so I, I've done it when I first started this ministry, that's how I met most of the homeless people. I would invite them to go out with me to lunch. Um, I have a group of guys that I meet with every Wednesday morning. And one of the guys was like, Dallas, how do I meet homeless people? And I'm like, well, just talk to them and invite them to lunch. And so he came back to me. He's like, I invited this guy to lunch and he's going to go to lunch with me. And I was like, that's great. Um, and, and, and so it's the same way you're going to meet people in your church is you're going to, you're going to go out and have a conversation with them. So my recommendation would be is start small and just, you know, like, just meet, if you meet somebody, just sit down and talk to them for 10 minutes, you know, and, and make it a two-way conversation. Um, one of the things that I get oftentimes is people sitting down and go, you know, it turns into 20 questions, like, tell me this and tell me that. Um, when my wife and I started it, when my daughter had a recital, we would tell the homeless about it. And sometimes the homeless would come to the recitals, you know, um, because we were sharing life together. And so I wasn't just telling them how to change their life. I was sharing things from my life too. Um, people tend to be more willing to tell things. So what I always tell people is, um, is sit down next to somebody and say, man, I'm from so-and-so, where are you from? Um, you know, because you've opened up the door, you can, you know, I'll say, hey, you know, well, it's hard for me, I'm from Virginia Beach, but like somebody who's from a different place, like Tim, you could say, you know, where, you're from Indiana or something like that. Mm -hmm. So you can say, hey, I'm from Indiana, where are you from? You know, and, um, and it opens up a conversation. Talk just like you would anyone else. Tim was talking about NASCAR earlier today. Talk about NASCAR, talk about basketball. Um, some of the best conversations I've had are about football games um, and things like that. And, and that makes life more normal. One of the things we do at our church on Sunday and we do here is we have, um, we put football games on so they can watch football games. Um, um, and, and it makes life more like, it makes life more um, normal. So helping them have a normal life um, is important. Let me ask you one, oh, we got another question coming in, but um, you've told us a couple of really practical things, a $5 gift card to McDonald's, yes. uh, or just handing out socks to the guy panhandling. I'd love to hear any other things. You started with bologna sandwiches on a Sunday afternoon. Yeah, I have, yeah, yeah, uh, I, have but, put, uh, I have people that put crackers in their cars. I, we actually have created something for people here in Virginia Beach that's a little card that has all our services on them. And so um, it says, I support PIN. So what I encourage people to do is keep an envelope in their car and hand them um, one of the, our cards and hand them a set of crackers and then put money in the envelope. And then once they get 20 bucks, give us the envelope. So to encourage people to come into services. And so that's, those are some practical ways. It would be, you know, asking them what they need. I don't know, maybe homeless people in different places need different things, but I would say McDonald's cards, um, socks, crackers, anything like that. If somebody truly will work for food, they will take food for free. Mm -hmm. um, but the problem is most people that are in Virginia beach specifically, there's plenty of places to eat. There's not enough places to s sleep. And so we have people that like, it's ironic, like we're serving a meal on Sunday and we have people that have a sign right outside where we're serving a meal saying we'll work for food. So it's, I, it's just kind of funny to me, like, you know, and people are handing them money. And then as soon as our meal starts, they take their money and they come in and eat our free meal. Um, so it's, I don't know, it's just ironic. Um, so how do you keep from overlapping services with other agencies? Um, that's a great question. We actually, in Virginia Beach, we have a coalition of um, organizations that help down at the oceanfront. I actually chair that committee. I actually started that committee because I saw too many of us overlapping services. 
And so we actually, um, and it's actually, I'm gonna grab this real quick. So um, we actually put together a card that has all the different organizations in the days of the week. And so you can see Monday, these are all the organizations. Um, and Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So what we do is we, once a, once a month, we sit down, all the different organizations, we sit down and we talk to each other. Um, we, we talk about trends, we talk about what's going on. We talk about our services and how they're overlapping. So I'll give you an example. We used to, we used to have a pancake breakfast and there was a Methodist church down the street. We used to do it every Saturday and they would do it one Saturday out of every, every month. Well, what they did is they came to us and said, we're going to stop doing our breakfast and we're going to start doing something else. Um, and so for the organizations in our area, I don't know in other areas, we, we are really serious about helping each other. Um, one of the things that we used to do, we used to have a housing program. So we used to, we used to buy mobile homes and put people in them. But the city of Virginia Beach spends millions of dollars on on housing, so we we're just a small nonprofit. So we stopped our housing programs, actually sold our mobile homes, and invested into healthcare and invested into our job training program. Um, so the city's helping house people, and we're helping people with healthcare and 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 job training. And so it's been a great relationship because if somebody needs housing, I recommend them to the city, and then if somebody needs to go into our job training program, oftentimes they'll send us they'll send them to us because the problem gets to be is housing doesn't fix everything. Um, if you can work, you need to work. Um, but that's hard when the, the goal becomes to get housing because if, oftentimes people say, why do I need to work Dallas if they're going to give me a house? Well, my thing is always when somebody gives you a house, they can take a house away. <laughs> that when you have a house, it's yours. Um, we had a lady who came through our, when we had our transitional housing program. She came through our housing program. And we worked with a local real estate agent, and she actually owns her own home now. Um, and so um, she became a homeowner. She actually came to me and said, I want you to pray that I can own a home in five years. And I said, okay, I'm going to pray that you can own a home in three years. And she was able to own a home in two years. Um, wow. because she began to make it her goal um, and she began to change things. But this is a person who had, um, who grew up in a, an abusive environment, um, ended up um, being addicted to crack cocaine, prostituted herself in New York um, for a long time to buy drugs um, and ended up in um, jail, ended up here in Virginia Beach. So when you sit down with somebody like that, the, the hardest thing when we took her through our transitional housing program was to teach her about a budget and to teach her about how to plan her life. And, you know, it's funny now listening to her give other people advice. She's actually now um, going through to, uh, a program to be a, a recovery group facilitator. And she keeps telling me she's gonna work for Penn. Um, and I do believe that. I believe she's gonna work for Penn. I told her, we, you just need to figure out how to raise your salary. <laughs> but I, th I, I, do, I do think she's gonna work for Penn. We don't, I don't have any staff members that used to be homeless. And that's something I've been praying for, that we'd have a staff member here that was homeless. And so she, she's in that position. So I'm praying that God will provide a place for her to, to, to be here and, and helping people full time. She, it's funny because we have a worship service on Sunday. She's part of our, um, our worship team. We have a worship team um, that's full of um, former homeless people and current homeless people. Um, it's probably not the best music you've ever heard, but um, the one thing I say is everybody worships with all their heart because um, I believe like the interest the coolest thing is that everybody has skills and abilities um, it's trying to tap into those and and we see people we have a guy by the name of Chris who came through our um, or excuse me Steve who came through our job training program he's working now he's got his own place and he's a singer in our worship band he's not a great singer but he sings with all his heart um, and so I I'm not a very good singer either so I can appreciate that all right. Well, let me interrupt you and, and wrap this up. Man, that, that's just loaded with great stuff. And again, I'm, there'll be an email that goes out to everyone tomorrow with Dallas's uh, email and, and website, PIN Ministry, uh, that if you want to follow up and get uh, some more ideas about how you individually or you as a church can start doing some wise things, communicating with others to find the gaps and not overlapping. That's, that's really huge. Let me uh, finish up just by telling you all that are on the call, uh, the webinar tonight, go back to our uh, slides here, about the upcoming webinars that we have coming up, because you are our best 
uh, promoters of the next one to the people in your church that are, are interested in these particular topics. So the, the next one that we've got coming up is uh, in March, and it's for your missions team and about how you can make a bigger impact by having fewer missionaries. And we're going to talk about that uh, for the evening. Then the one after that in April is local politics and the local church. And this is not national politics and all the crazy town that is, but about uh, how how the church and people in your church can get involved in local politics to make an impact in that way. And so uh, we've got a gentleman that was recently elected to his, to be the county supervisor, and he's a member of one of our church plants. And so that's going to be an interesting converse, conversation. And then in uh, May, we have one about why merge. And we're going to talk to leaders from two churches that chose to lead their church to merge with larger churches and why and how that's turned out. And uh, then uh, our last thing that I'll tell you about is for those of you who are um, in ministry, our biggest event of the year is coming up next month called The Art of the Sermon. Uh, last year, we had 109 preachers that showed up for this in three locations. This year, it's in four locations uh, that you can see the dates here, two on the, the teens and two the following week. And uh, Taylor Brown is presenting for us. And if you've been to CIY, Mix, or Move over the last 10 years, you'll recognize Taylor Brown as one of the featured speakers at that, those conventions. And uh, he is coming home. He's from Virginia uh, to talk about... Uh, about uh, how he develops great creative sermons. And that's going to be a, a great time together. So hopefully you will register for one of those four events and bring some people with you. So uh, there will be links to all of these in your email tomorrow as well. And if you would forward those links to the people in your church that we'd be most interested in one of those three webinars or to the Art of the Sermon, we would uh, really appreciate that. And finally, as usual, I want to give final uh, credit to uh, the Mid-Atlantic Christian University for being our ministry partner by sponsoring our webinar platform. We're really thankful for that. And so hopefully uh, you're very involved with MacU as well because they exist to serve the church uh, as just like we do. Well, thanks for your time tonight. Dallas, thanks for joining us. This was about as packed full of great information as we've had in one of our webinars. So we're really glad that you've joined us. And I wanted to pray very quickly for you and your ministry. And then uh, we hope to see some of you uh, that are on tonight's webinar on one of the future ones. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, right now we pray for Dallas and that you would give him wisdom and a discernment on how to best lead his ministry to serve the homeless in his community, and we're thankful for the time that he spent with us tonight to help us learn how we might do that in ours. And uh, so we know that there's no better way to serve than, um, than to give someone uh, a cup of cold water in your name. And so uh, we want to have the lenses that we would see the people in our community that need that the most. That's what we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. All right, folks, have a great night. And Dallas, thanks for joining us. You're welcome.